Welcome on into the Wolverine Live Show. Clayton Safey here with Anthony Broom. Turning the tables a little bit. AB, I uh, believe you're a little under the weather, so I will uh, kind of lead us off at your request, uh, but just letting the people know about that. Make sure to like this video on YouTube if you're watching live or after the fact. Make sure to subscribe to our channel as well. And as always, head to the Wolverine.com. You can use the promo code UM1, which will get you two months of premium access for just one dollar 50 cents a month it's pretty much like a free trial so we are here on a monday evening anthony you go outside it feels like we should be on the golf course right now i know you're a little under the weather but how's it going we just got off our trip to indy for the combine yeah uh you know no free ads but nyquil and dayquil are wonderful things i think i may have picked something up from no disrespect intended uh, but a mouth breathing reporter somewhere at the nfl combine so um Airborne, airborne stuff, man. Not, uh, you know, it is what it is, but uh, doing all right. Uh, thanks for steering the ship tonight. Um, you know, that's that'll be the end of it. We'll just get into the show, I guess. <laughs> well, let's do it. <laughs> uh, perfect transition because we were in Indianapolis over the last several days, got back Saturday night, uh, afternoon ish, and it was quite eventful. It was pretty busy from our standpoint, but man, um, you walk down the hallways of the Indiana Convention Center, you see guys you either know from the Los Angeles Chargers. Had a great conversation with Dylan Roney. We said hi to Jesse Minter. We saw Mike Elston. Saw Steve Klingscale. Jim Harbaugh was all over the place. And uh, Or you see guys that played at Michigan. You see fellow reporters that cover Michigan. It was the Michigan takeover with 18 Wolverines, a record. Six offensive linemen, that was also a record. Uh, but, A.B., let's start with this, I guess. From your perspective, what was the most impressive thing or or prospect that uh, you saw from Michigan over the last few days? Well, I want to want to make one thing very clear right off the bat. I was not accusing anyone on the Michigan beat. Those are our buddies, and uh, and I don't think anyone brought anything with them down to Indy. So, uh, but most impressive guy. I mean, you know, take your pick. There's 18 of them there. I know a bunch of guys didn't work out, which I, you know I was hoping to see a little more of. But again. Something that we discussed, I don't remember if it was on a recent show or if we discussed while we were down there in Indianapolis, is that these guys for Michigan that were there uh, had a like a five or six week delay compared to the rest of the prospects in terms of their season being over and some of them opted out of bowl games to start preparing for the NFL draft. These guys were in Michigan football shape uh, for, you know, almost until mid-January, really, when you think about it. So. I'm not surprised that a couple guys, you know, a couple guys were, were, um, I think was uh, Braden McGregor was dealing with an ankle injury. Uh, JJ had said something he wasn't going to run because he had a hamstring thing that was going on. Um, So to me, I think the conversation probably revolves around JJ McCarthy. I think the most impressive thing with him is that, you know, he put on what was it? 17, 18 pounds, you know, since the end of the season. And maybe, you know, maybe he was playing a little heavier than he was listed at the end of the year. Maybe he was a little lighter. I'm not exactly sure which way it went, but uh, he's up around 220 now, which, you know, one of the knocks on him uh, heading into the next level is that, you know, he's a had kind of a slight build and, and a guy that, you know, for being a former hockey player, certainly looked like a hockey player a lot throughout his Michigan career. But, you know, he looked like, uh, you know, I saw people on our board saying he looked puffy. No, he looks like an adult. He looks like an NFL quarterback now. Um, and, Again, uh, I think throwing wise, you know, it wasn't a perfect day, but then I don't really think you go into those type of events seeking perfection. Um, you know, a lot of the scouts just want to see you compete. They want to see how you fare on a variety of throws. I don't think anything that JJ did this weekend. Um, I think it affirms the teams that had him up here. Uh, but in terms of winning, you know, over the detractors, I, I, I don't know where things stand on that front. But I thought JJ had a good weekend. Mikey Sainer still, I mean, had about as rock solid and good a weekend as I think you could have asked for. That's a guy who I think is going to be, you know, an impact guy on defense right away for someone, probably in the second round. Chris Jenkins had a good showing. How about Cornelius Johnson? I didn't think he had four, four, five speed, but, um, you know, running like a gazelle out there. And even, you know, Roman Wilson had said he wanted to run somewhere in the four twos and the four threes. Technically did. He just got into the 4-3 range at 4-3-9. And, mm-hmm. you know, that's that's nothing to shake a stick at either. And he probably even can improve on that number, given that a couple of those runs, it didn't look like he got off to the best start. But, you know, it was impressive um, to hear 
And if, cause you know, we have our takes about these guys, right? You start to hear the national narratives about like the Michigan offensive linemen where they say, you know, these guys are one to two years advanced in terms of their knowledge of the game, the things they can understand things that, you know, when they go up to the, in these informal meetings and draw plays out, these guys are, are advanced for, for what uh, they were asked to do. So all in all, I mean, maybe that's a long, you know, me blabbering on about the weekend at large, but um, really hard to pick out any quote unquote disappointments. Cause I think guys that may have quote unquote disappointed were the ones that didn't really do much anyways. So uh, we'll see what happens from here. Uh, Pro day is on what I think, believe March 22nd, somewhere in that range. So mm-hmm. a couple weeks to get things in order. And the draft is hard to believe only six or seven weeks away now. Yeah. I didn't think anyone like completely disappointed, um, you know, based on my expectations at least, but you know, we also weren't there for probably the most important part of this, which was the interview process. Now, most of these guys probably didn't have any formal interviews. JJ McCarthy had 11. I'm sure Blake Corum had a couple, um, but it's a lot of just kind of conversations with teams or whatever. The formal interviews, they get 15 minutes and each team gets 30 of those. So they try to limit them. They only have so much time to get through them at, at all. Uh, JJ said he's going to have some in-person uh, meetings going to different team facilities as well before the draft. I think he said after the pro day, which is March 22nd. So for him, I mean, it's you're looking at one, he competed out there because there were quarterbacks that decided not to. So I think you have to give him credit for that. I thought he looked pretty good. He missed a few throws, but he made a, a few really nice throws as well. Uh, his agility numbers were pretty good. He he led all quarterbacks in the three cone drill. He was tied first in the uh, 20 yard shuttle as well, which is good for him to be able to show that part of his game off because he is athletic and that's an asset that he has to his game. Um, I mean, man, Blake Corum in the drills like that. To, in, in the second thing about another guy that competed is Blake Corum, who said the day before he wasn't going to run the 40. And I don't know what exactly happened, but he ends up running it four, five, three, a good time for him. He had slimmed down uh, seven pounds from what he was listed at Michigan. Then he goes through the drills and he's just moving at another speed than the rest of these running backs. The, the drill where they have the three bags set up where then at the last second, you know, the, the guys holding the bags kind of like tilt them one way. And then you have to go to the open hole. He was reading that faster than anybody. I don't think that surprises people that that have watched Blake Corum over the years, but I thought he did a really good job. He looked smooth catching the ball too, which is huge for him. He wants to show he can do more of that, he said. So I like what I saw from Blake Corum. And then Mikey Sander. So we were in person uh, at Lucas Oil Stadium watching his drills, and he was another guy. You had the stopwatch out. Yeah, we had the stopwatch out. We had uh, the binoculars going as well. We were also listening to the broadcast, or you were, while we were going through it. And uh, so we were multitasking, but man, Mikey Sainer still in Quinion Mitchell, the Toledo corner, I thought is in the same category, but they just, the way they moved was just at a different level than most of the rest of the corners. So Mikey Sainer still comes out of it and you see analysts talking about him as being the top nickelback in the draft. So to me, it was those three that stood out. It was really like three Michigan's three best players last year. So it's not surprising, but not all the time does college stuff and tr- production translate over to the NFL and being a prospect. But in this case, it feels like it, it is. Um, so I thought that was really good to see as well. But yeah, like Roman Wilson gets four, three, nine offensive linemen. Those of them that worked out looked pretty good. Zach Zinter, uh, Zach Zinter said he's getting healthier and healthier should be good to go in six weeks, which is good to hear. And he will bench press at Michigan's pro day. But uh, all in all, I thought it was a pretty good weekend for the Michigan or, or week for the Michigan guys at the combine. A couple injuries, as, as you mentioned, Colson, Mike Barrett also seemed to be hurt. Braden McGregor, Zinter sat out, um, and I think that was it. But yeah, it did like Jalen a- Harrell have something going on too, or did I misremember that? He just didn't run the forty, um, mm. but he went through the drills. He looked he looked pretty good, really slim. Um, yeah, he said he was. He said that. Training for the combine is like becoming a track athlete, which I can imagine is the case for some of these linemen like Jalen Harrell because it's just completely different than training for football. Yeah, and maybe it's the brain fog. Maybe it's just the fact that I had so many guys. I mean, it's crazy. I didn't even didn't even think about Blake Corum. I mean, he was another guy that I thought, um, you know, you just watch the broadcast. I know that Rich Eisen's on it. So, like, there's always kind of a Michigan tinge to some of the analysis, but – uh, unprompted a lot. I mean, Daniel Jeremiah, who to me, I mean, he is, I think he's, he's up here. He's the gold standard in terms of 
you know, draft evaluators, at least that do it on TV. Um, you know, you get the sense that he puts a lot of time and effort into his evaluations. It's not really a tabloid draft thing, which no offense, sometimes the ESPN stuff to me can kind of read that way. But, you know, overall, I think, uh, you know, something I've said a few times on the huge show, uh, something I've said on this show before, you know, having that many guys there and having that many guys perform well, you know, it's, it's incredibly affirming because again, we know what a lot of the national narratives were around this team at points throughout this year, but you know, this team was good. This team was great. They were elite. They were one of the best college football teams ever because they were one of the most talented college football teams ever. And uh, again, you know, it's probably, I'd have, if I had to put a number on it, it's probably only JJ that goes in the first round, but I mean, they've got a core group of five or six guys, you know, with JJ, with Roman Wilson, with Chris Jenkins, Mike Sainer still Zach Sinter. Um, I think I just forgot Blake Horm again, even though he's on the screen. But with this cluster of five or six guys, I think those are quality NFL players that I think will start and probably have success for a decent amount of time to the point where you're watching these games on an NFL Sunday and you see Blake Horm, you know, goes off for let's just say the Los Angeles Chargers or Mikey Sainer still is playing for the Cleveland Browns and comes up and you know makes a huge tackle. And you're just gonna, you know, every time you're gonna remember this team for a long time, not just because of the memories you have of them from what they did during this season, but also seeing them in those different NFL uniforms and kind of just be like, man, they really did have something special there and something that, you know, again, I know things are going to look different moving forward. Uh, I don't know that, I mean, it was a once in every couple decades type of team. And the one thing I would just keep saying is don't take that for granted. I mean, this was uh, what an impressive group of guys overall. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned Chris Jenkins because he's somebody I wanted to highlight as well that I that I didn't in that top group of I, I would add him in with the JJ Blake and Mikey Sainer still, but 491, 40 yard dash, fifth among 19 defensive tackles. The 10 yard split was sixth at uh, 1.7 seconds. He his broad jump was third among 20 defensive tackles. His 20 yard shuttle, 4.78 uh, seconds, was seventh among 11 defensive tackles. The bench press, 29 reps, tied second among defensive tackles so he showed out that was the mutant right it was the the strength combined with the speed and agility that that's why ben herbert gave him that nickname and that's exactly what we saw i think with his workouts as well so he's a guy that probably goes in the second but has a chance to go to the first just like a few of these michigan guys uh outside of jj i agree with you probably all of them after the first round but chris jenkins is one of the guys in the conversation for being able to uh maybe secure a late first round draft spot. So yeah, draft still a ways away about six weeks um, or, or seven weeks maybe in Detroit, but it's going to be exciting to see where these guys end up and, and to watch them at the next level. But anything else before we move on to basketball? Yeah. Just a couple like non Michigan takeaways from the combine. I think this quarterback class is really solid. I think all five of those guys, you know, Caleb Williams, Drake may Jaden Daniels, JJ McCarthy, um, Bo Nix, so six guys, Michael Penix as well. I thought all of them looked pretty. I mean, the ones that did work out, I thought looked good. Uh, the ones that didn't, like we know what Caleb Williams is. I mean, the quarterback class is good. He's afraid the wide to receive. <laughs> Maybe. Um, he's afraid of uh, landing planes or if the moon is made out of spare ribs or whatever the hell the the questions and narratives were uh, with, with some of the questions at the combine. The wide receiver class is loaded too. I mean, we watched almost all those workouts on Saturday. While watching JJ, I mean, you start thinking about the offensive line group. I mean, that's I think this draft in general has a chance to be one of the better, more talent rich NFL drafts, even taking out. I mean, not you can't take the Michigan guys out of it. They're part of the reason for that. But so many good players across college football. And uh, God, I mean, it's I think the crazy thing to me is that a guy runs a four five now or uh, runs a four four five or four five in Blake's case and Mikey Sandristle's case. And you're just kind of like, eh, you know, that's a good number. Eh. You got guys out here running a 422 or 421 now. It's insane. Xavier Worthy. There's the right. uh there's a photo of me of me if for people watching this. Stopwatch, we got the binoculars as well. Photo credit to Anthony on that one. But yeah, I know it was fun seeing it in person. So that was the uh that's the NFL combine. We'll obviously talk more draft as the weeks go on before late April when the draft comes in our backyard to Detroit, Michigan. So excited for that. 
Uh, let's sh- let's shift gears to Michigan basketball, which since the last time we were on the air, they lose by 30 points on Thursday night at Rutgers. They lose by 23 points on Sunday afternoon at Ohio State. Two games that you would look at and think are winnable, but then you remember that, no, those are bad teams Michigan was playing. Michigan's a terrible team. They now have 22 losses, ties the program record. Unless they beat Nebraska Sunday, win the Big Ten tournament, and win the national championship and have no losses from here on out, they will break the record, have the most losses in Michigan basketball history, kind of officially one of the worst teams in program history. And it's it's tough, even tougher right now without Olivier Kamwa to get some of these wins against these bad teams. But Nebraska's a good team coming in on Sunday, looking to cement their spot in the NCAA tournament. But the even bigger news, Anthony, was Friday when John Sanderson – officially resigned from Michigan, the longtime strength coach, renowned strength coach, uh, who did a great job, famous for developing all sorts of talent at Michigan, turning them into lottery picks, first round picks. I mean, Nick Stauskas, Karis LeVert, Kobe Bufkin, you could go on and on of the guys that uh, stuck around in the springs and uh, in the summer and put in the extra work with Sandman, but a big blow for the Michigan basketball program. They haven't had him for a few months, but He's now officially not with the program. They reach a settlement. And, uh, you know, some of the details of the altercation with Juwan Howard from back in December, at least from Sanderson's standpoint, were um, emerged in the athletics report from Brendan Quinn and Katie Strang. The thing that, you know, maybe if they had their strength and conditioning coach, they wouldn't be so gassed at the end of games and lose by 23 points or 30 points. And and part of that's depth and talent. Like, this team is bad. They're terrible. They're bad because Jawan Howard built this team and that they, they were they were built to be bad going back to last May. This predates heart surgery stuff. This predates Sanderson stuff. It predates all of that. And I said that back in the summer. Um, you know, for me, it's, you know, not only has the bedrock of competency completely eroded away from this program, Um you know, with John Sanderson being gone and pushing that guy out the door, because make no mistake about it, it was him being pushed out the door. Um, you know, you've lost one of the key cogs in what made that program successful under John Beeline and what made it very successful in the first, you know, two to three years of the Juwan Howard era. And, you know, it's just um, this thing has bottomed out in a way that I'm not even sure I expected it to. Uh you know, to not have there's I have so many questions still about this uh, John Sanderson situation. But, you know, the, the one takeaway, you know, because it does seem like this is a lot of he said, she said, I'm sure there's a Joan Howard side to it, too. I'm sure there's a Michigan side to it. I'm sure there's a player side to it. I don't really care. I mean, at, at the end of the day, you know, when we talk about this program being bereft of talent, being bereft of player development to have not only one of the most important guys in that regard with the program anymore and his son is one of the best basketball recruits in the country you can go ahead and kiss that pipeline away too like i just feel like the program got worse on two fronts and likely more fronts than that i mean this is um it's a damn shame i think that's the way that i would put it best um you know the fact that uh you know, it's just more drama in the athletic department. You know, what was what was the line from Succession? Clay, you can correct me if I'm wrong. You know, the poison drips. It drips. It finds a way to drip from the top or whatever the whatever the quote of it was. Um, Sounds you know, right. When there is this much drama, this must this much mismanagement with men's basketball, with matters pertaining to men's or to, to the football program to a lot of the Olympic sports that have, have tapered off over the, la- over the last few years. I mean, there's no, there's no mincing words for it. I mean, this is, this is a uh, ward manual and this athletic department are, is just, it's just been so badly mismanaged over these last several years. And for some reason there have been, and I'm not saying anyone here is like this, but there's been like a hesitancy to say that. What is what is what is Ward Manuel's legacy? And I'm not turning this into a Ward thing. This is a Jawan and John Sanderson thing, but it's just something else under the under the banner of the athletic department where it's just like, what the hell are we even doing here? You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean it's it's another 
just a weird situation. Like to have, I think it was described. Was it the analyst calling the game on on Sunday where it's like, and he was kind of using it, saying like, "Well, it's hard to evaluate what this season is for Michigan." And I'm but, so tired of hearing that too, by the way. But he talked about the the distractions that this team has faced, and a lot of them are are kind of self inflicted. It's like Doug McDaniel in one of the most unheard of situations where he doesn't play in road games for six, you know, six road games and is playing at home. And then, you know, by the time they come back and they were six and nine when that, when that decision came down. So it's not like they were having a good season, but by the time he comes back for road games, this team has basically mailed it in. I mean, the effort has been something that they've been able to, you know, keep at a a relatively high level throughout the year, but the last two games have been pretty brutal in that regard. No discipline, especially in, in Sunday's game, but you have that situation, you know, um, you know, another distraction being this John Sanderson situation. I mean, it's something that happened months ago, but it's probably had an impact. You have a new strength coach that's kind of filling in on an interim basis, Mike Favre. Um, you know, it's just not the same. I mean, there's a reason why he's been called the secret weapon to the program. And the reason why Jawan Howard years ago talked about him as one of uh, the, you know, the reasons why they had a lot of success early on in his tenure. So it's just, it's just like, it was one. It'd be one thing if the basketball wasn't as good as you would like it to be, which it's not even close to where you want it to be. But then you have these other situations, and I think it's really disappointing. Uh, a couple of the key details from the report from the Athletic, and again, you can go read that uh, over at the Athletic, Brendan Quinn and Katie Strang. But <clears throat> basically, what had been reported, um, you know, by Jeff Goodman and some others when this incident happened, is essentially what was in some documents that were obtained by the Athletic. Uh, Sanderson writing an email to Ward Manual, which was him kind of filing a complaint there. He said that Jace Howard was berating a trainer that uh, caused a scene before practice. Sanderson intervened from 30 feet away saying, you're a student athlete. He's a professional. You don't talk to a professional like that. That's disrespectful and entitled. Um, Then he said that uh, Sanderson wrote that Jawan Howard came at him angry and ready to fight as staff and players held him back and separated the two individuals. He kept aggressively pursuing me to fight, Sanderson said. said, um, You know, there was the internal review. Nothing was found to warrant disciplinary action for anyone involved, Ward Manuel said. But John Sanderson, which seemed to be a source of frustration for him, was not able to talk to the players that he has worked with for years. The Michigan basketball team um, was in the building, maybe doing work with the, the golf teams that he also that he also trains, but he said no no one should indicate that it is voluntary, Sanderson wrote, of basically having no involvement with the program. So it just you know, like you said, it's just like it just it's a shame, you know, essentially what happened. Yeah, I mean, why this is one of the the bigger questions I have because we do know that Juwan has the the zero tolerance tolerance policy in his, you know, I don't know if it's on his contract or, or what it is, but Obviously, you know, we're talking about a multiple time offender in terms of not being able to control his anger. And again, I'll say this with the asterisk next to it of we don't know the other side of it, too. I trust John Sanderson's account of it. At the same time, it is just one account of it because and we probably won't hear the other accounts of it because no one else will will go on the record about it. But, um, you know, with that or with that zero tolerance thing on his on his docket, why did Juwan, like why they had, they had the excuse to be like, Hey, Juwan's going to sit out the road trip at Iowa for whatever insert reason here while it gets investigated. I mean, it's, it was blown up to be a bigger thing. I think because Juwan Howard was there and because the body language was looking back extremely odd in that game uh, between he and the staff. And even though you know, that was a game they won too, one of the few games they've won this year. So to me, I, mean, I just, I don't, if it's cause I'm rambling, it's cause I'm still like, I don't understand any of it. I really don't. Um, I don't know why the culture is so bad to where I forget that it's Juwan's son uh, and a guy who's a team captain or has been a team captain and Jace, you know, you have talking back to a training staff member. You've got someone else on staff yelling from 30 feet away. You've got the head, you know, anytime I see, you know, a quote saying the head, you know, Juwan is ready to fight. Weren't we past that two years ago? I mean, wasn't, you know, I'm just so done with all of it. Like it, it would be one, like these are the things that get magnified 
when you are terrible, but it's just all, you know, it just all has to go in the evaluation of, are we really going to run this back? Because you listen to that broadcast on Sunday and it's, again, I am extremely sympathetic to the heart surgery thing. I mean, that is, uh, you know, my father underwent a serious heart procedure, you know, uh, of, of quite a few years ago. And it's, it's scary. And it takes a lot of work to get back from that. And I am so extremely sympathetic to that. But when you talk, you know, you hear him, to, uh, you know, talk like the Doug McDaniel thing is such a distraction to the team. Well, guess what? They have academic advisors that are supposed to make sure that this shit does not happen. Um, you know, the John Sanderson thing, again, another self-inflicted wound. Um, you know, most of the things that ail them are self-inflicted. And it's not bad luck. It's bad management. It's bad leadership. Uh, and it, quite frankly, I mean, again, it just, I don't know if, I, I can't even say I don't know if it should be allowed to continue. It can't continue because every time you think it can't get worse, then they lose by 30 at Rutgers. And then they get blown out by an interim coach at Ohio State uh, who's done an excellent job. Like, no disrespect intended to him. Um, this is the first, you know, Michigan Athletics you know, the teams that we've covered, you know, I've been doing this for, this is year 10 for me. And there have been teams that are bad. There's maybe, you know, in terms of the class of being teams where you just can't wait for this season to end, this one's at the top of the list with a bullet. Yeah, and, and it's not just that the season's bad. There's not a lot of hope for the future. You don't know who's going to stick around. There aren't really young guys that are that are playing well that you feel like there's promise for the future and there, are, you know, the young guys that are playing well at times, like a Doug McDaniel for a game here or there or, or Terrace Reed for a game here or there, you don't know that they're going to stick around. They, they have, they're going to have options to go other places because those are two talented players. Um, you know, and they probably will because Michigan's NIL is terrible. Yeah. There's another issue, right? Issues like that, that, you know, you, you weren't able to retain, you know, an all American they had last year. So, yeah, that's I think what makes it most disappointing is when John Beeline had a couple down years and they missed a tournament in 2015. You know, a lot of that was due to injury. It it wasn't great to miss the tournament, especially after the success you had. But you kind of knew that the guy in charge, you know, knew how to get them back on track. And it doesn't mean that there weren't hard decisions that were made to help them throughout, you know, different different portions of the John Beeline era because he turned over his staff at one point. You know, there were things he had to do. But the fact that he was in charge, a guy that had gotten four different programs to the NCAA tournament, gave you a little bit more confidence. The fact that there were, it was a different era where you had young players that you felt like you could, you know, kind of feel good about the future with. Uh, it just does not feel like that at all, and it's not like that at all right now. Uh, let's take some questions from the chat, the uh, YouTube audience here. So we have a few already. Make sure to get your questions in right now in the live chat. We will answer them. Super chat. If you give a donation there, we'll move you to the front of the line. We also have some questions from our message board over at thewolverine.com. But before we get into questions, we got to talk about our friends over at Lewis Jewelers who uh, have been serving the Ann Arbor and Detroit region since 1921. Lewis Jewelers' reputation and continued success stems from their belief that a successful jewelry store is built on integrity, quality customer service, and quality products. <clears throat> Lewis Jewelers is a proud partner of Michigan Athletics. To ensure every client that walks through their doors or peruses their virtual store is taken care of, they have a non-commissioned trusted advisor team that's always ready to provide professional experience, advice, mm -hmm. and expertise. There's no pressure, no commission. They are located in the bustling city limits of Ann Arbor, Michigan. Lewis Jewelers proudly serves the Ann Arbor and surrounding southeastern Michigan communities by providing an exquisite selection of fine jewelry as well as customer service to his residents and visitors. You can visit them at their new location, 300 South Maple Road, Ann Arbor, or online at lewisjewelers.com. You see the uh, the websites up on the screen right now. Some some sweet stuff. Lewis Jewelers, everybody knows them in Ann Arbor. They are the go-to places where Ann Arbor gets engaged. So uh, yeah, check out lewisjewelers.com or in-store at Lewis Jewelers. Uh, let's take some questions and let's start with uh this comment from blank name about the combine we got a few combine ones here so let's go with with that but i knew cornelius johnson was not slow four 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 forty. he was actually four four five but basically same thing and yeah when he gets going he's he's pretty fast ab we've seen that on a couple jet sweeps throughout his career where 
he's not super quick on some of those like short routes or anything, but that guy can move once he's once he picks up a little bit of steam. Yeah, he's like like I said earlier, like a gazelle out there. Um, you know, a long strider too, someone who picks up steam as he runs down the field, which the Ohio State Buckeyes are aware of with a 69 yard touchdown there and a 75 yard touchdown there in 2022. So like we knew he was fast. It's just when you, you see these guys get out there and, um, and again, sometimes you put the, uh, you know, no disrespect to uh, the freaks list or, or anything that Ben Herbert may have shared, but sometimes you wonder if some of those numbers are a little inflated. Uh, the funny thing is, you know, when these like Chris Jenkins and when Cornelius Johnson, uh, when any of these guys went out and did their thing this weekend, it kind of affirmed a lot of what they said they were able to do in the past, which is kind of, you know, makes it kind of a bummer that JJ didn't run the 40. Cause I think, I mean, you and I are talking, I think he probably could have run in the four or fives. Um, maybe that was before he put on, you know, whatever it was, 17, 18 pounds and yeah. the five or six weeks it's been uh, since the end of the season, actually almost two months now time is flying by my friend, but uh yeah, it was it was good to see. Uh, you know, draft Twitter loves him right now. I keep tabs on on those guys because you know we obviously do a lot of draft coverage and we'll have a lot of draft coverage this year, given the amount of guys that Michigan is sending. Uh, a lot of people saying, "Oh, well, he's another Michigan receiver that's in the mold of a, a Donovan Peoples Jones or Nico Collins." And I suspect when people put on the film, they won't see that same uh, type of guy. Uh, but certainly the athletic profile, the length. Um, you know, I think he could be a solid fourth or fifth wide receiver uh, given the right opportunity in the NFL, but we'll see. Uh, I think he's someone that might be on the rise a little bit. Next one is from Kent V who says, CS, how close were your hand times to the laser times? It was really tough when we were in person there at Lucas Oil because the section they have the media in is kind of like in the end zone of one side and then the 40-yard dash ends on the 40-yard line opposite of us. So you have to adjust a little bit. I was way off at the beginning, probably a full like 10th of a second or more uh, because you got to start it on time. You got to stop it, but you're not really on the line. So you don't know exactly when it is, but once you get dialed in, you can get within uh, a couple tenths of a second, which is pretty good. And you were doing the same thing with the, so we went to Dick sporting goods, got the, uh, the stopwatch out there. Shout out to Dick sporting goods and Indy. And then uh, you were doing it on your phone as well. And we got pretty close, I would say. Yeah, I was trying not to smash, like put my finger right through my phone screen. It gets kind of intense uh, doing that. I think the closest I got, I forget, there was a guy that ran a 4.55, five, five, and I think I timed it at like a 4.57. That was the closest I got, but most of the time it was like, oh, my God, this guy just ran a 4.28, and then you look up at the screen or look at the broadcast. It's, oh, well, he ran a 4.63, so you're way off. Um, yeah, it was uh, – you were you you were in full scouting mode. You had the binoculars out, which you had to. It was kind of a weird setup for for us there. Um, but yeah, cool to cool to see that live. I mean, if, I think we talked about this too. You know, if back in the day, if we as kids had access to that, I guess it would be cool to see once. But I think after a bit, I'd be pretty bored if I was a kid there because I was pretty bored after a bit as an adult there that knows what that event is. So, but yeah, kudos to you. You were. Uh, you're in the full scouting regalia there. Yeah, you're just trying to uh, trying to fit in over there. Yeah, it's a little bit boring. And then you watch Xavier Worthy run a four two one, and you're like, okay, I'm fully back in on the combine after watching hours, endless hours of content. <laughs> that was so awesome from it. Yeah, I mean, imagine Michigan would have won the Natty by 28 points if they had Xavier Worthy on on the team. Yeah. So <laughs> it could have been even better. Uh, Thomas Ackerson wonders which of the 18 former Wolverines do you think Jim Harbaugh is most most likely to take with his selections? I mean, it, it's it's tough to say for sure because it has to line up. You know, like the first round, I don't think he's going to take a Michigan guy unless they do. Yeah, I mean, I, I just don't see that happening. I mean, it, they're not going to go quarterback, and JJ's the only one because they draft that five. But you're looking at like second, third, fourth. I mean, Mikey Senior is still. Zach Zinter, Blake Corum, if Austin Eckler does move on from the Chargers, which seems like is expected, I think would be a great fit for the Chargers. Do we know what he looks like in this offense already? So I think those three would be great, and those are kind of his types of guys too. I know they all are, but uh, but I could see A.J. Barner maybe in a mid-late round for him too. I think if there's a guy there that he, and he knows these guys better than anybody, and he knows a lot of the college guys that he recruited and played against and, and scouted throughout the seasons too, 
Like, I think the Chargers are going to have a really good draft this year and for a couple years because a lot of their staff is really familiar with the college players. But especially if you're sitting in the fourth round and there's a Michigan guy on the board that they think is uh, getting undervalued by other teams, I think they're going to take him. Yeah, I mean, given that there are 18 guys there, I wouldn't be surprised if he took – or I, it, I, I say he, it's the Chargers. Uh, Joe Hortiz is the GM, but Harbaugh, we would think, is going to have a pretty big say on – what that uh, roster winds up looking like. I think Blake is, I don't want to say a slam dunk, but if I set betting odds, he'd be the odds on favorite, followed by Mikey, followed probably by Chris Jenkins, Zach Sinter. Um, yeah. Yeah. And again, if some of these guys, like a, let's say a Trent A. Jones, slips through the draft and doesn't get taken, I mean, you're going to have these priority free agent spots available too. So, again, I'll do some. It'd be fun to do like some Michigan draft props as we get closer to the draft, but I would set the over under on Michigan guys that wind up with the chargers at if I'm, if I'm throwing the undrafted guys in there too, I'll set it at two and a half. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it could go over. I mean, that's, that'd be I mean, a lot. The but kicker? That... Do they have a kicker? James Turner could be in the mix too. True. I mean, yeah, it's gonna be, it's gonna be fun. I I do hope they get a few of those guys. And the Chargers fans are gonna have a field, or Chargers reporters are gonna have a field day if Chris All Jenkins goes them. there. Um, because yeah. Chris Jenkins won the uh, enthusiasm unknown to mankind helmet sticker before the season. So did JJ. I think a couple other guys, maybe Blake too. But it's gonna make for really easy stories to write for those guys. So uh, hopefully for their sake. Uh, we get some Michigan guys that go to the Chargers. Lori O wonders, did they televise the quarterback skills portion? We got JJ's cone drill result, but don't think it aired. Yeah, they don't air a lot of like the shuttles and cone drills and stuff like that, but they stick more to the 40-yard dash, which plays the most and everybody's most interested in. And then the on-field drills. So, yeah, JJ did pretty good in some of the agility drills. And then, uh, you know, I, I'd say it was pretty solid in the, uh, the on-field drills as well actually throwing the football to some of those receivers yeah it would have been nice to see some of the movement stuff but throwing wise again um you know some random draft guru on twitter that just throws nfl into his his handle probably said he sucked and he's just a check down guy but again i i don't even i can't even sit here and pretend I, i'm i know what you're supposed to take out of this stuff but you know when he when he finishes throwing and then all these guys in the nfl say God, he might be the most NFL ready guy of any of these quarterbacks. It, hey, what the hell do I know? Maybe the guy on Twitter knows more. So it'd be like the homeless guy that has the end is near sign being right, you know? <laughs> True. I mean, that's the thing, though. Nobody really knows who's going to pan out of, out of these quarterbacks. We don't know that Caleb Williams is going to be good, but a GM, the Bears GM, Ryan Poles, is going to take him because you're not going to get fired drafting Caleb Williams. It's just kind of the way it goes. Um, Let's move can into I, some Can I go on a, a, just a mini rant here for a second? We talked about this, too, at the hotel. I'm, I'm getting kind of tired of this narrative that, like, Michigan ran a service academy, like, triple option offense where they only throw the ball, like, four times per game. I mean, and I think it was 10 of the 15 games that they played, or 11 of 15. I don't have the stat in front of me. J.J. threw the ball, like, 20 or more times. And in most of those games, only played the first three quarters of the game. So – can we stop with that? I mean, it is it is the laziest thing in the world to just you know talk, do the production things. Oh well, uh, he's he, he can't throw because they didn't trust him to throw. No, they had a freaking battering ram at running back, and in short yardage situations they ran him into a pile. In goal to go situations they ran him into a pile, and they scored and they won and they won more than anyone else won this year. So turn on the film. Enough with the lazy stuff. Seriously. And they were one of the slowest teams in terms of pace of play in the country, so less plays as well that factored in. But, yeah, J.J., two years of starting uh, in, in college gives people a pretty good he idea. Back, he dropped oh, back 320 times this year. Get out your little notepad and take notes. Don't just look at the box score. You know what I mean? Plenty of opportunities there. Tyler Fires 1580 says, is there a way Harbaugh can get 18 picks to guarantee Michigan gets 18 drafted? That would be pretty epic, but. Appreciate that one. Uh, tile yeah. fires 1580. Uh, let's get to one on the message board, but continue to uh, fire away in the YouTube chat as well. But Sasquatch 616 says, Who was the most famous non Michigan related person you got to meet at the combine? He said, I'll settle 
for close proximity to, but no actual interaction with said person if necessary. That's where I'm going to go with it. It was Mike Vrabel. We were <laughs> ran into him twice, once getting a uh, Starbucks in the uh, Marriott dinner. lobby. And then once as we were checking in for our reservation at prime 47 steakhouse. So, you know, we were rolling with the big time guys, but um, Roman Wilson would find this interesting Ohio state guy, Mike Vrabel. We didn't talk to him, but he, he did order a coffee and a blueberry muffin. He was also lugging around a, a Louis V bag the, the whole weekend too. So, Little Ohio, Ohio State guys, they're Louis V, man. Him Louis and Marvin v. Harrison Jr. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was interesting. I mean, he looked like a dad that was like holding his kids' backpack, like waiting for them to get out of school or something. Really expensive backpack, yeah. Really expensive backpack, which you know, NFL coaches, they they got money burning a hole in their pockets. So yeah, I mean, I know one of the reports uh, about why he didn't get a job this cycle was because people found him intimidating. Standing behind him in a Starbucks line and like hearing him order a blueberry scone which again no shade to blueberry scones i would i would gladly order the same thing um it just didn't feel very intimidating that's all but he does look like a guy that would drink like 12 eggs straight up for breakfast he does also the the starbucks lady like called out his name you know how they have the name mike and then he he said her her name to him or he said her name to her as he grabbed it and she was super confused. So it was a little intimidating. I will say, um, <laughs> Mish, Mish 56 says always a question still, when will all of the defensive coaches be officially confirmed and announced go blue always. So Don Wink Martindale, the defensive coordinator, he has been officially announced. Greg Scruggs defensive line coach has been officially announced and it's huge because today's the first day following the dead period. So they can recruit now. But we're still waiting on Brian uh, Jean-Marie and Lamar Morgan, linebackers coach, D-backs coach, respectively, to be announced. But it feels like they're getting those underway. And I will say, finally, it's about damn time. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's. I guess that's pretty much it. Um, yeah. <laughs> Pump It Up says, do we upset Texas and Oregon and keep our home win streak alive? Hmm. You know what? I'm going to say Texas, yes. Oregon, no. I think Oregon is, sorry, Ohio State, uh, the best team in the Big Ten next season. So not the best non-Michigan team. We'll see what happens with them. But uh, I think we could get a very – I think conditions are right for an early season. Texas is back. Oh, wait, no, maybe they're not type of moment. That is true. It, it could be um... – I don't remember exactly what happened in the season when they remember they beat Georgia in the sugar bowl. They, mm -hmm. they were back. I mean, it was Sam Ellinger said, you know, we're back. And I think, you know, they pretty much fell on their face the next year. That was Tom Herman. It's not Sark who seems to have things going a little bit more at Texas. They finally make the college football playoff, but I could see something like that happening. FanDuel has early lines out for Michigan against Texas, Michigan, a two and a half point home underdog. And then uh, they don't have one out for the Oregon game yet, but the other lines that are out while we're on the subject is Michigan's an 11 and a half point favorite over Washington in Seattle on, on October Ooh. 5th. And then a seven point home underdog or excuse me, road underdog to Ohio state on November 30th. And again, don't have the uh, Oregon game line yet. I would imagine they would be slight underdogs, pretty similar to the Texas line as well. So, I mean, it's kind of a basic answer. Like, I'll say probably they split those two, but that's that wouldn't be horrible. And if you split those two, you beat USC, and even if you lose to Ohio State, you're sitting at two losses, you're in the college football playoff. But it's early. We don't know Michigan's full roster. We don't know all the opponents' full roster. So I don't know that you can – you know, I don't know how much FanDuel is allowing people to, uh, to bet on those games at this point yet because there's still a lot that has to shake out between now and then. Um yeah, I think Michigan's going to get Texas into a rock fight. Uh, what is the date here? Monday, March 4th. Te take the under on Michigan and Texas. You can mark that down. All right. I like it. I, I may do that when we get off here. Uh, BW Blue 5 says, what underclassmen on the basketball team will be around next season? Do you think Doug Terrace or others leave because of the current state of the program? I don't know which one of them will leave. Um, and I don't love speculating on that individually, but odds are given the state of college basketball and given the state of the program that there will be underclassmen 
that leave Michigan's program. And guess what? They're probably going to get some guys too. They, they're going to have to overhaul quite a bit here, the roster, one way or the other. They are they do have senior day coming up on Sunday. Namari Burnett is going to be honored. Terrence Williams is going to be honored. Doesn't mean they can't come back. They still have another year. Those will be key guys to try to stick around for another year. But in terms of young guys, I mean, they're going to need to try to keep these guys around. And, and if there's a new coach, I mean, that's going to be the task of, of that person. So it's it's really hard to say exactly who might be around, but I odds are there are guys that are going to leave. Yeah, I, I think whether it's Juwan or not next year, I think we're looking at a situation where th- this might be like a – think like those early Fred Hoiberg rosters at Nebraska where it's just – you might flip the entire thing. I I, I wouldn't be surprised if that's the case. Uh, I would – nothing – I don't think anything would surprise me at this point. Same here. Uh, 2HF540B says, do you believe the Hall hype that Orgy has been promoting this past weekend? I think we have the tweet we can pull up here, but Ben Hall, Michigan's sophomore running back. Yeah, basically Alex Orgy tweeted about him saying, I think it's coming up here. He said, Ben Hall is going to play good ball for us this year. Just felt like saying that. So yeah, Ben Hall flashed in the spring game last year. He still has some guys ahead of him on the depth chart. Some guys kind of in similar shoes to him, like Cole Cabana and those guys that are going to try to, um, you know, try to take a spot too. You have Jordan Marshall coming in, so I think it's going to be really competitive. But I do think we've seen, uh, you know, some flashes from Ben Hall that show, uh, you know, some promise for the future. It would be good. Uh, it would be good to see. And again, for as much flack as as my card is caught on the recruiting trail, he just has a way of just developing talent and finding guys. And sometimes his evaluations match what you see on the recruiting trail, like Jordan Marshall might come in and play right away this year, you know, as, as the only top 100 guy, I think in that uh, recruiting class this year. So to me, I mean, uh, what could Ben Hall have a role? Absolutely. Because, you know, whether you think that Donovan Edwards or, or Colel Mullings or whoever might have, you know, a pretty big timeshare of carries, you know, there's going to be, there are going to be carries to be had for everyone, especially again, you know, we take for granted just how, again, talked about it earlier, how automatic Blake Corum was in those goal to go in the short yardage situation. So Ben Hall, to me, I mean, the one thing that stood out, and again, it's it's a spring game, it was really our most extensive look at him last year. I think the key for him is getting him to play like, I don't know how to word this, getting him to play what his like height weight would suggest he can play as, which He's 5'11", he's 230, 235, whatever it is. Uh, he has the chance, you know, but he's got some juice to him too. You know, he's he he's a he's got a little bit of wiggle. He can get out in space a little bit. Um, so the vision, the physicality, I think those are major keys for him. But, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised to see him have a big year at all. Corey G chimes in on, on the topic saying the wave of running backs will continue the run dominance. Yeah, it's, it's going to be different without Blake Corum, but I do think you have some good options. And I've said this, and I'll probably continue to say it throughout the offseason, and I'm excited to talk to Donovan Edwards uh, probably in a few weeks here when spring ball starts up. But him having a healthy offseason should really help um, for his year as well. But they, they still have a pretty deep room there. Lori O with another question says, what can you tell us about did Will Johnson get offered as much money as Keon Sab was? Uh, see Keon Sab's new ride? I did see that he has a new uh, Mercedes or at least got the windows tinted on an old Mercedes. But I would imagine it's – it looks pretty new to me. Um, Lori, great question. I think absolutely Will Johnson got reached out to. I saw The Athletic had an article saying that one player, and it was it was unnamed, but one player was offered $1.75 million by another school to transfer. If that wasn't Will Johnson, I would think that uh, that Will Johnson was offered more, and I got an alarm here going off. So Utah. You got a quiche in the oven over there? What's going on? It's exactly what I have. Okay. Okay. Um... Yeah, I mean the thing, the thing with Will Johnson, we talked about this recently too. Uh, you know, I don't know. First of all, it, it seems like short of verbal confirmation, like straight up coming out. Well, he did say that, or his father said to our EJ Holland, that, "No, Will is not going anywhere. Um, you know, Will needs to also be paid." That's me saying that. That's from nobody else. And I think that um, they've done a good job taking care of him. But at the same time, you know, he's he's a he's a legacy guy. He's won a national championship at Michigan and he's probably going to be a top five or top 10 draft pick next year. So you don't, I don't, for a guy in his situation, 
I don't think you need to go chase a bag in, at another school because this time next year, you're, we're going to be talking about him and what he had just done at the NFL Combine. So, uh, yeah, I mean, good for Keon Saab. Um, you know, it's one of the the blessings and the curses of having, you know, both uh, Rod Moore, Makari Page returning. Um, yeah, I mean, there would have been a role for him somewhere, but Alabama needed a Alabama needed a safety or needed someone to tamper with after their safety, their star safety got tampered with and went to Ohio State. So it's just kind of a chain reaction, and that's college football now. It's a circle of life in college football. That's right. <laughs> um, Coach Jim for UM has a couple questions. We'll start with how many times per day do you guys still stop and think, we did that? I, I mean – it's a couple times a day. I don't. I don't. I don't know if I phrase it that because you know I'm an unbiased journalist. Of course, uh, I am repping some home field apparel. They're a sponsor, so no big deal. I do think a couple times a day. It's like it, it is wild that they won the national championship. Something I'll tell you about Clayton. Um, given that you know we we stay together on road trips and whatnot, he will just sit up in the middle of the night and just pull it down. Just do the pull it down. And he'll say, he'll yell it out loud. And that's what sets off alarms. And it's a whole thing. But True. yeah, you know, it's, I'm literally staring off screen to my left. I still have a bag of confetti The the game programs from both the Rose Bowl, the national title game. This is a new one here. I'll show this off. Uh, I got the commemorative ticket Ooh. from the national title game. You don't even have a real ticket. You got in for free. No, oh. I had to make something up. So I'm section press row D seat 34. I, I made that up. I think we were in row D. That's all I remember from that. But, um, you know, I got poster with confetti behind me there. So it's like every day, you know, I walk into this room every day and it's a reminder of that. And uh, it's, uh, it was, I mean, such a cool experience. I mean, real time, we talked about this too. You just kind of get bogged down into, you know, it is a lot of work for us. And this isn't me patting us on the back, but, you know, we put out as much stuff as anyone does. And in real time, you kind of have your head down and, with some of those road trips, I mean, you know, as, as fun as it was to be away from home for 14 out of 15 days, towards the end of it, you are just w ready to get home. But now, you know, it's uh, it does sink in a little bit the further removed you get from it. And uh, insanely awesome experience, insanely unique experience. I can't say it's something that we'll never cover, we'll never do again, but um, it's hard to go 15 and 0. It's hard to win two college football playoff games. Michigan hadn't won a single college football playoff game until they won that Rose Bowl, and, and they did it by the skin of their teeth. So, uh, yeah, every day is uh, – it was it was very cool to see. And, again, you know, the fact that we have those those national title commemorative issues in our hand now. Uh, I got a stack of them in my living room out there. It's uh, – it was it was a good time, and it was a, it was a pleasure, a genuine pleasure to, to cover and to be around. So three times or how many times a day? Three, three times. I'm I'll say two for me. Um more more than three. I'll say more than three. More. Okay. More. Uh, <laughs> um, let's see. We do have let's just finish with the Juwan Howard. I know we talked about him earlier, but we have a few more. Big M man says, What should I do next basketball season when Jawan comes back? He also says, Who would you replace Jawan with? give top two to three with one dark horse. And then coach Jim for UM says percentage chance. Jawan is Michigan's head basketball coach next year. I mean, look, it, it just, there's so much that could unfold. I mean, with Ward manual, you know, potentially being the guy making this decision. And he, he seems like a guy to me that would, that would be extra loyal and a little bit more slow moving on making a move like this. He credits himself what? for Jim Harbaugh. Yeah, exactly. He credits himself for not firing Jim Harbaugh, which would have been absurd yeah, to do. But every game that they play, every time this team goes on the floor and you watch them. It just it's an absolute like freaking that, disgrace. I'll put it, words in your mouth. It's disgraceful. It, it, well, it just feels like every time they hit the floor, the percentage chance that Jawan Howard does coach Michigan next year goes down to me. Yeah, I think that's – I said this earlier today. Um, He's making it very easy on Ward. I said it's tweeted this out after the game. You know, if anything, Ward's been criticized for taking the easy way out. Some people would say the coward's way out, but taking the easy way out on a lot of issues. I think the easiest way out of this thing is just hitting the eject button because they are so bad and the bottom has fallen out 
so spectacularly that it is the most logical, common sense decision in the world to move on. But then again, last winter, it was the most common, most logical move or common sense, most logical move in the world to make Jim Harbaugh the highest paid coach in the Big Ten. And you waited until the day he left to put your best offer on the table. So again, with this leadership, with this regime, again, I don't think you can rule anything out, but to me, it should be so cut and dry that it's not even funny. And the funny thing is, it's not going to be cut and dry because that's what they do. That's why we're still on week three or week four of assistant coaches for football still needing to be hired because, because they hired someone without checking their likes on their tweets You know, several months ago with football. Now we have to do three-week background checks on guys that have been in the industry for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. It's ridiculous. It's embarrassing. And I think that if you're someone that has a vested interest in Michigan athletics, you should be absolutely disgusted by how slow moving and by how reactive a lot of this stuff is. Well, here, here's the hard part to me. It, it may seem easy, but okay. Then he has to go hire somebody else. Good. Yeah. And do you want him doing that? You have to convince somebody that they have enough support at Michigan, you know, a program that lost Hunter Dickinson to another great program in Kansas. And you know, that's the hard part is then, okay, now come in and turn over the roster. That's probably going to happen anywhere. A guy takes a new job because that's just the nature of how things go uh, in college basketball right now. But, you know, you fire Jawan Howard and, you know, there are only more challenges than, you know, I'm not saying it's, it would be the wrong thing to do, but there are still other steps that have to work out for this thing to actually improve. It doesn't just improve just because you fire him. And again, I'm not saying well, that it, that's reason to keep him. Yeah. I mean, it's not, it's not a fear of the unknown is not a reason to, to continue down this road. Um, but also I, I just don't like, I, I, I don't know that there may have been a time last year where I would have bought the hit, hey, you know, maybe you run it back. Like, you, you know, there's not a guarantee it does get better, but when you are three and 16 in big 10 play, when you're about to set the record for the most losses in program history, I believe it is. I, I, I literally, I do think that, I mean, I think, yeah, I do think there's a real good chance that whoever you bring in next won't lose to long beach state. And to my alma mater last year and, and the, to McNeese and, you know, these winnable games that, that slip away, um, yeah, I, I do think that it's getting to the point where I do think literally anyone else would be better. McNeese sitting at 26 and three right now. So, <laughs> but, oh, well. no, I agree. I agree. Um, totally. So it'll be interesting. It's, uh, something we've talked about for months and now it's kind of right around the corner. I mean, you have one regular season game left. You have the big 10 tournament next week, which starts Wednesday could end Wednesday for Michigan. So we will see how it all plays out. We'll be covering it all. At the Wolverine.com. You can use promo code UM1 to get premium access two months for just one dollar. So also that deal is in the description of the video here on YouTube as well. Like the video if you're watching, subscribe to our channel, and we will see everyone next time. <laughs>